Welcome everyone. I'm so excited you're joining us today. My next guest always makes me think of this Samuel Taylor Coleridge quote. What if you slept and what in your sleep you dreamt? And what if in your dream you went to heaven and then plucked a strange and beautiful flower? And what if when you awoke, you had that flower in your hand? Ah, uh, what then? And the reason this guest makes me think of that quote is she really does make you feel that your dreaming mind has infinite possibilities within it and that you can be or do anything. I love talking to her. I've spoken to her a couple of times before and I'm so excited because this is the first time I actually get to see her and she's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, her name, of course, is Dr. Claire Johnson. Now, she's an internationally known lucid dreaming expert and best-selling author and the first person in the world to do a PhD on creative lucid dreaming. She's endlessly fascinating. So we're going to dive right in because <laughs> she often has ocean metaphors and themes in her dream writing, which I adore about diving into the dream world. So hello, Claire. Hi, Teresa. Lovely to see you in person. Wonderful. It is, isn't it? Because we've spoken before, haven't we? But only audio only. And I've admired yeah. your work so much. And I, I, I am really like Alice in Dreamland with this summit, talking to people that I have admired in this in the world of dream work for a very long time. And to get to speak to them, I feel truly honoured. And you are no exception, Claire. You're well known to a lot of people within Shift already, as I know you run a course. But for people new to Dr. Claire Johnson, would you mind just sharing who you are, what you do, and, and your passion for lucid dreaming? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Teresa. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you brought in that Coleridge quote, because one of my passions is bringing gifts back from the dream world, bringing back spiritual gifts or healing gifts. And this is something I've been working with all my life. I had my first lucid dream when I was three years old. I also had lots of scary uh, nightmares and out of body experiences, sleep paralysis experiences, and all of those experiences just catapulted me into the world of dreams and I had to figure out for myself what was going on there, what I could do there, how it all worked and I learned how to transcend fear and bring back gifts. So it's basically my life's work, working with dreams, playing with dreams and exploring this amazing inner world. And so I ended up studying it at university, doing a PhD on lucid dreaming as a creative tool and I went on to become president of the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And I've just been teaching for many, many years now, too many to, to count. And it just never fails to excite me the incredible, powerful gifts that people can encounter in dreams, in lucid dreams, and also in liminal states of consciousness that I'd like to talk about today. You know, those kind of uh, the liminal states where you're floating on the cusp of sleep, those threshold states can also be extremely valuable and powerful for us to explore. Oh, thank you. And you also run Ocean Retreats, don't you? Hence my backdrop. <laughs> yes, I know. I love that backdrop. I love everything to do with the ocean. And it, for me, it really does symbolize the unconscious. And I have many dreams of diving into the ocean as a mermaid and uh, finding treasures and bringing them back. Uh, so it's, uh, it's wonderful. And the Ocean Retreats uh, are usually in Portugal. They're absolutely gorgeous. So a small group of dreamers, you can go so deeply into this work. So... It's oh, I, I'm glad you said mermaid. I can see you as that actually in the world of spirit in the invisible realm. I can <laughs> actually I can just just picture it. But anyway, let's just do some basics. Um, lucid dreaming, of course, is knowing or being aware you're dreaming when you're dreaming. Um, but how do people who are new to this get lucid? 
Ah, yes. Well, there are many ways of working towards greater lucidity. Uh, one of the things that we need to do is build our waking awareness, our waking lucidity, um, becoming more aware of this actual moment right now, which is this, you know, what state of consciousness are we in right now? Are we dreaming right now? Let's question it. Let's define it. It's not just either you're awake or you're asleep and there's nothing in between. Let's look at the nuances of consciousness. Let's be alert to them. Let's be lucid about the way that we live our life, the thoughts that we think. So yeah, that's one part of becoming more lucid in our dreams is to become lucid in our life. We can also work at recalling our dreams and writing them down or drawing them just to honor them and to bring them more into our waking consciousness. And uh, we, can, we can just really decide what it is that we want to do with lucid dreaming. Some people, they say, oh, I want to get lucid in my dreams, but they don't really know why. You know, what is it you want to experience? Do you want to work at improving a, a sports skill, which uh, scientific studies have shown we can do this uh, effectively in lucid dreams? Or would you like to discover more about the nature of consciousness? Uh, or would you like to simply have fun and fly around and, <laughs> you know, not be in a physical body anymore? What is it that you want to do? So it's good to have an idea of that. So you have this goal in your mind and that helps to focus your intent. So there are all sorts of ways um, of working towards waking up in your dreams. And one of the things that I really love to do is just float on the cusp of sleep in the hypnagogic state and watch these strange images come up, arise and fall. And that's, that's a lucid state of consciousness. It's a portal, it's a gateway state, and it can take us into lucid dreaming or it can take us um, to other dimensions, to more spiritual planes. So uh, there are all sorts of ways of entering lucid dreaming. Um, and I think the thing to remember is that we don't have to be an amazing lucid dreamer and have tons and tons of lucid dreams in order to receive all these gifts from our unconscious. There are many other lucid states of consciousness and every time we engage with those lucid states, we're taking one step closer towards uh, having more lucid dreams. So it all feeds in together. Nothing is separate. <laughs> oh well, I'm I'm starting to get more lucid in my dreams, and I I get trouble is I get so excited when it happens. I wake myself up. You got any advice for people who've had that? I I can't help it. I just get so excited. I'm dreaming. This is a dream. <laughs> it's gone. It's like an inception. All the buildings fall down. You know that scene Aww. when the dream collapses. <laughs> That's right. It collapses. Yeah, we get too emotional, too excited. Yeah. <laughs> goes. So uh, I developed a technique called the CLEAR technique, C-L-E-A-R, and this is what you do when you become lucid in a dream to calm it down, to stabilize that state of consciousness. The first thing is to take a deep breath, calm yourself down, uh, and then look around at the dream, keep your eyes moving, because often lucid dreams happen in rapid eye movement uh, state of consciousness, uh, and so it's good to keep those eyes moving. People find that if they fix uh, one point for a long time at the start of a lucid dream, it sometimes wakes them up. So yeah, look around and then engage with the dream. Reach out and touch the dream or rub your hands together because that stimulates the brain and keeps you more awake, more alert. Um, and also you can announce that you are dreaming just to remind yourself, wow, I'm dreaming. You can narrate what you're doing. You know, I'm standing on a dream mountain and there are these purple dream clouds floating past just to remind yourself that you're, that you're actually having that dream so that it doesn't slip away because it's so real. It's so beguiling. You know, the dreamscape draws us in uh, and then it can be easy to lose lucidity. Uh, and the final thing is to recall your dream goal. What is it you would love to do in this lucid dream? Would you like to sit and meditate? Would you like to hug a dream tree? Would you like to try a dream flight? Would you like to connect with a deceased loved one? Would you like to ask a question of the dream and receive wisdom? So those are the steps of the clear technique. But the main one really is calm down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but... Is lucid dreaming dangerous? I mean, whenever I talk about it, especially in, in the mainstream, people who are kind of new to this, it's always like, oh, you don't want to do that. It's dangerous. 
I mean, why has it got that reputation? Is, yeah, I mean, this is a natural state of consciousness. We're lucid right now. This is lucidity. Lucidity is all about awareness. So basically, all that dream lucidity is, is a raised level of awareness during sleep. And we dip in and out of lucidity during a night of sleep anyway. Children naturally have lucid dreams without even knowing what they are, like I did myself. Um, and, and basically, it's a spontaneous state of consciousness. It can just arise. So all it is, is being aware in the dream. That's all it is. And in fact, in the night of sleep, especially after a mini awakening, which we all experience multiple times a night, we have a more alert brain, a more alert mind, and that's opt often an optimal state in which to slip back into a dream with that raised level of awareness. And then we can go directly into a wake-induced lucid dream. And it's fascinating to actually do that and feel the dream build up around you uh, and, and then just explore. So there's, it's not uh, any more dangerous than just being awake right now. <laughs> <laughs> um I'm sure you, you obviously you work with a lot of people who are working on their lucid dreaming you, you know yeah. what do most people want to do from your research in their lucid dream what's the most common thing people say I'd like to do x <laughs> what is it what is it okay so it's it's interesting a lot of people want to have sex yeah <laughs> <laughs> they want to have dream sex, there's no repercussions, you can't get a sexually transmitted disease, uh, they can have a lot of fun and, uh, you know, wake up and, and nothing has particularly changed in their waking world. So they like that, recreational sex. Um, other people really want to, to go for spiritual uh, expansion, you know, how, how can we get to these experiences that actually wake us up more on our path through life? Uh, how can we learn to, well, to discover why we're here? What are we doing here? What happens when we die? Uh, how can we how can we live our best life? So those those larger sort of more philosophical questions are also very common. A lot of people also come to me because they have nightmares. And, you know, they, they say, I, I just I need to get lucid in those nightmares to stop them from happening, you know, so that I can change the nightmare or move it into something else. Uh, others come because they have a physical problem, you know, they have an illness or a disease and they want to heal in their lucid dreams because it can be a, you know, a really wonderful, very powerful thing to do in a lucid dream that you can ask for healing or imagine um, healing light beaming onto you, beaming through your body uh, or dive into a healing pool in a lucid dream with an intention to heal and you actually can wake up buzzing from those experiences feeling that healing on a cellular level in your body. Others want to improve sports skills, as I, as I said before, to improve their swimming strokes or their kickboxing strokes by slowing time down in a lucid dream, practicing that physical movement. And then, um, yeah, when they wake up, it's, it clicks, you know, they've, they've got it. So what we do in dreams does have an effect on our brains, on our bodies, uh, and ultimately on our waking life, of course. Would yeah. you say that our brains don't know the difference between the dreaming and waking state? Well, um, our brains our brains do know the difference. Um, I, I think, you know, that's why it's really important to ask ourselves while we're awake, you know, to question our state of consciousness. Am I awake? Am I dreaming? And we do these reality checks to find out because the body reacts differently. That's one of the big clues for the brain, <laughs> that we're, <laughs> whether we're awake or we're asleep, because the brain will say, um, okay, it's all feeling a bit dreamlike here. Uh, then, then you do a reality test. You jump up into the air, uh, you can't float, you come back down with a bang, well, you're likely awake. But if you jump up into the air and you find yourself, you keep rising up into the air, well, hey, you know, it's a dream because that doesn't happen uh, in, in the waking state. Uh, or you can manipulate um, matter. You could put your finger through your hand uh, in a lucid dream or through the table, but we can't do that quite as easily <laughs> in the waking state. So the brain, um, well, the brain has all sorts of clues available to it, but people find it uh, quite difficult sometimes to realize that they're dreaming while they're dreaming because the dream world feels so real. And that's why it's important to question and to do these reality checks and look out for signs and symbols that commonly occur in our dreams so that they can act as triggers to raise our awareness um, so that we become lucid in those dreams. 
I mean, I certainly find that the older I get, the more dreamlike feels. And when I was doing research with very elderly people and their dreams, it was it was almost like it that it was the dream state had become so real for many of them. And I'm wondering if is that a kind of a preparation for if you believe in life after death? Are we entering into some kind of continuum there? I'd love your thoughts on that. Dreams of the elderly. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Now, um, I mean, a lot of research has been done um, with with people who are nearing the end of life. And it's really fascinating to talk to them about their dreams and to hear the kind of things that are happening in their dream. Mm. So a lot of it does seem to be very much a preparation for death. So people will dream um, that they're surrounded by angels or they're being uplifted by, by sort of heavenly bodies or they find themselves drifting free of their body, having an out-of-body experience and moving towards the light. Uh, and, and so all these dreams seem to be kind of preparing us in, in a really beautiful way uh, for the transition, the spiritual transition of death. Um, and a lot of people manage to do very deep dream work as well as they're nearing the end of life. Uh, their dreams are bringing up things in their life that they have never really got over or dealt with, you know, uh, soured relationships or um, a, a tragedy that they just had to push away because it was too painful to deal with. And sometimes those things come up towards end of life asking for healing. Um, so it's it's really a very uh, fascinating time of life uh, to be dreaming, and there's so much more to look forward to as we go through life. You know, all these uh, this richness of dreams doesn't go away. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the one great thing about getting older, in that your dreams become so so expansive. Uh, they can do anyway, and and it makes you excited to age, <laughs> which yes. I think is uh, <laughs> we we need that. <laughs> Yeah, we but do. <laughs> you talked about what we do in dreams. Um, I know you do a lot of work about inspiring creativity in dreams, and you've, I believe you've written novels, haven't you, based on your dreams. I'd yeah. love to hear about that. Oh, sure. Yeah, so I've written two lucid dream-inspired novels. The first one, Breathing in Colour, that um, that involves a sort of a spiritual quest, um, and it's a girl who goes missing while she's travelling through India, and she leaves behind these lucid dream collages that she's done and they become like kind of clues for her mother to understand what was going through her daughter's psyche at the time of her disappearance um so that's one of them and the way that lucid dreaming helped me with that was um it helped me with the plot like i could go in there and say i want to meet this character from from my novel find out more about that character and realize ah, okay the plot's not going in the right direction because actually he's feeling like this so I need to change the plot. Um, and so I would react to what I would learn about the plot and the characters in my lucid dreams. Uh, and I would also get these amazing vivid images from my lucid dreams, and then I would weave them into the story, either into the characters' lucid dreams or into some other element of the narrative. Um, and, and it's wonderful. Dreams give you so much feedback. One, one of the, um, well, the main character in Breathing in Colour has synesthesia, which is when the senses are intermingled, you might taste a colour or smell a shape. And uh, I just I came across that idea through having a lucid dream where I was lying on a beach um, and I was gazing up into the sky and I put my hand down and took um, a fistful of sand. I couldn't see it, but I suddenly knew that it was bright orange. I was like, how could I know that the sand is orange? That's so weird, I could feel it through my skin. And I looked, and yeah, the, the sand was bright orange. And so I looked that up after that dream. I'd not heard of synesthesia. As soon as I'd heard of it, I was like, perfect. That's just what my main character needs. Yeah. So you can really kind of draw on your dreams in, in all these fascinating ways. And, and with Dream Runner, it was a, a different kind of thing that was more to do with nightmares, moving nightmares. We all have this natural sleep paralysis when, uh, when we dream. And... Uh, some people unfortunately don't have it, so they enact their dreams and it can be pretty dangerous. So that novel explores what could happen when someone is physically enacting violent dreams. So, yeah. Oh, well, so many great novels and, and works of art and literature, movies have been inspired by dreams, lucid or, or non-lucid. And I was listening to you and I was thinking, oh my goodness, this should be a movie <laughs> or a series. It sounds 
awesome. Oh, mm -hmm. and do you help other people explore their creativity and um, through their lucid dreams as well? Is that what you do on the retreats? I'm trying to. Yeah, exactly. That's one of the things I teach, and one of my main methods is lucid writing which is when you go into a, a kind of light trance state, you relax and you bring a vivid dream into your mind and you allow it to develop and change and, and then you write without stopping. It's like flow writing, uh, without stopping to think, no judgment. Um, and it's quite amazing what can come out of that lucid writing. It keeps that connection with the unconscious mind. You're working with dream symbols, dream images, and they just start to transform and transmute on the page. Um, I started teaching that technique uh, when I was finishing up my PhD. Um, I taught it as a creativity technique, but suddenly people in my workshops were like healing recurring nightmares or um, understanding why they had a particular destructive pattern going on in their life because they just, in, in five minutes of lucid writing, they'd had all these realizations. Then I realized, wow, this is actually a transformative healing technique. Uh, and so that really opened it up uh, for me and I've been teaching it ever since. Well, it certainly can. I think if you if you want to do some creative writing and you're having a block, just write down your dream, you know, <laughs> Even whether it's lucid or not. I think that can be a great starting point, could not it, to fire up that creativity. You mentioned mm -hmm. nightmares then. That's just a question I would like to ask you. How can lucid dreaming help ease nightmares? You know, because a lot of I get messages from people who are frightened sometimes to go to sleep because the nightmares keep them awake um, or wake them up. I mean, um, yeah. well, how can lucid dreaming techniques help there? Yeah, well, like you, I, I was inundated with messages from people with nightmares saying, please, you know, help me make the nightmares stop. And that's why I wrote The Art of Transforming Nightmares purely as a response to those people because I was spending so much time writing the same things to people. Yeah. And I also realized that, um, that, that there were so many individual differences uh, in terms of sleeper and dreamer types that it would be really helpful to create a book where there were all these different practical techniques that fit different sleepers and dreamers. So there's a nightmare quiz in that book as well, which people can go through uh, to lead them to the practices which would be best for them to help them with their nightmares. And what I often say to people is like, although the top question is, how do I stop my nightmares? Actually, nightmares can be seen as healing gifts they come to help us and heal us. They come to make us whole. They are a red flag saying, hey, look at this. This issue has not been resolved. Hey, come and look at this issue. And if we ignore it, they come back again and again, maybe with a different kind of nightmare story, but the same theme, or maybe it's exactly the same nightmare repeating. So the way to work with uh, nightmares, the best way, the healthiest way to work with them is um, to unwrap them to do gentle dream work with them, to go back in there as an empowered dreamer and choose a different nightmare response, choose a nightmare solution and be flexible and realize that you have so much more power than you think and you can change the nightmare story. And changing that nightmare story can be just absolutely vital for people who are having really terrible nightmares. They change the story. It sounds really simple just to do that, uh, but it's a well-known PTSD technique as well. And then they'll find that the nightmare actually changes. It doesn't stay on the same tracks. It's like rerouting a, a train, you know, you make it go off in a, a different direction. You do that with your nightmare story. The nightmare story actually changes at night and you free up so much energy with which to live your life and be happy and have a beautiful night of sleep and refreshing dreams. You know, you wake up with them um, with a whole new life. So it can really save people's lives to do nightmare work if they're suffering from debilitating nightmares. Yeah. And it, would, would you say nightmares are a kind of a bit like tough love in that maybe you haven't been picking up the messages from, from other, your dreams before that? And it, it's, it's almost like the dreamy mind says, right, you're gonna have to have something a bit shocking now to take notice me, <laughs> yeah. do something about this, heal. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it does feel like tough love, uh, for yeah. sure, when the nightmares come. Uh, and it can really feel for people like the nightmares are kicking them while they're down. They're like, I'm already exhausted and struggling. Why am I having these nightmares? And they wake up very tired and they don't have the energy to get through their day. But yes, it, it really is a question of... Um, face the nightmare with a therapist if it's a really terrible nightmare and, ter and really upsetting for you, but go back into there and, and find the gift, find the message. 
allow the healing to happen and we can heal on very deep levels of our soul when we do nightmare work so in fact that's another reason they're a gift because they have so much energy they pack such a powerful punch that when we unleash the healing within that wow it's you know it's big <laughs> i know and, and your art of transforming nightmares is a, is a blissful read actually very very motivating um it really is and also your lucid dreaming books as well which are just incredible resources for anyone listening thank you <laughs> but no thank you again I'm, I'm going to quote again you that august strindberg quote also comes to mind i dream therefore i exist that's you dr claire johnson <laughs> you embody it um in every way thank you thank you thank you and i know you're going to um generously have offered us a, a meditation to take yeah. away um Yes, well, I'd like to say a few words about that first, um, because we all experience uh, spiritual awakenings as we go through our life. Some are big awakenings, some are very small awakenings, um, but we can actually invite and initiate these spiritual awakenings uh, by working with lucid states of consciousness, such as the hypnagogic state that I touched on earlier, which is the state of pre-sleep imagery and sensations. That hypnagogic state is magic. It's um, the, the, the brain waves are a mixture of alpha and theta. You know, we've got relaxation and dream coming in. Uh, it's incredibly creative. And it is a portal in itself to spiritual states of consciousness. It's a portal for lucid dreaming. It's a portal for accessing wisdom. It's a portal for connecting with dream animals, spirit guides. We can also connect with the deceased when we go through the portal of hypnagogic imagery and we can reach states of beautiful lucid light where there's no dream imagery, we're just floating in this incredible blissful light. So really these threshold states are something that it's fascinating to work with and we can train this. Uh, we fall asleep various times in a 24 hour cycle because we have the mini awakenings in the night uh, I, I just had a, a session with a private client and we worked out that the fact that she always gets up to go to the bathroom at 3 a.m. is actually a lucid superpower <laughs> because that's the moment, you know, she comes back to bed after that. She's a, a bit awake, but not, uh, not completely awake. She can drift into this amazing hypnagogic state of consciousness, watch all these images rising and falling, lead them, uh, let them lead her into an actual dream, perhaps into a lucid dream if she can keep it going enough and keep that awareness going. And so she's got this, this beautiful entry point into lucid dreaming and beyond. And we all have this. We all have many awakenings. We all have the moment at the beginning of the night when we fall asleep. We also have nap time if we're someone who enjoys naps where we can just really get into that hypnagogic imagery and let it lead us somewhere. Let it take us somewhere. Let's make the most of these spiritual portals. And so... The practice that I'd like to share with you today actually leads you into the hypnagogic state and beyond that uh, so that you can identify your own spiritual portal and then go through that to receive wisdom or spiritual gifts. So this is a, a, a practice which will take maybe about um, 12 minutes, something like that. If you can listen to it lying down with the lights dimmed, that's perfect, because uh, it's best not to have too much light when you want to enter the hypnagogic state. Um, and just uh, adjust the volume so that you can still hear me. And this is a practice that I adapted from the art of transforming nightmares, and it's called Open Your Spiritual Portal. Lie down in a comfortable position Allow your eyes to float closed and relax. Bring your attention to your breath as it moves in and out of your body. And with every exhalation, release any tension and allow your thoughts to slow down. You don't need your thoughts for these next few minutes. 
so let them go. And now imagine a beautiful ball of light of any colour floating above your head. And now feel that warm light at the crown of your head, beautiful and relaxing. And now experience the ball of light moving gently down into your head, bringing a sense of calm and well-being as it moves down into your neck and shoulders, moving down through your arms and hands, relaxing you more. And the ball of light moves into your chest warming your heart and down into your belly and hips releasing any tensions and the light moves down your thighs and knees and all the way down to your feet so that you are encased in this wonderful light. And you may begin to notice that your mind is drifting slightly. You may become aware of light forms advancing or receding or geometric shapes you may see flashes of random imagery like a pink kite or a child's face A flickering fire or a dolphin in the ocean. Stay aware and observe any imagery as if it's a surrealist movie without getting attached to it. experience sensations such as floating or falling or hear random noises or voices or feel vibrations. These images and sensations are all a natural part of the hypnagogic state. So relax and observe with detachment. You may notice that your body awareness has changed. Perhaps you can't tell exactly where your body begins and ends. Or perhaps you can't feel your body much anymore. This is a sign that you are floating on the cusp of sleep. 
Stay lucid. Stay present. And now, before you, you see a wonderful portal forming. This inviting portal may take any shape or form. It might be a circle of swirling energy or a vivid animal or a glowing mandala, a kindly tree vibration. See what comes up for you and with every tap of the gong your portal becomes clearer and stronger. you'll simply experience deep peace and joy. Take some time now to see what happens for you in this spiritual space.
ask any question in your heart or communicate in any way that feels right or receive the wisdom or energy that you are here to receive. if there is a spiritual gift for you in this beautiful space, accept it with gratitude. to return with your gift and any wisdom or insight you have experienced. You turn and see your wonderful portal glowing, waiting for you. And you move towards it and float effortlessly through it, thanking it for this journey. And now you feel the gentle rhythm of your breath as you settle back into your physical body, feeling peaceful and happy. And you can take two or three deep breaths each breath embodies you further and you can wiggle your fingers and toes, open your eyes and look around at the beauty of this world. Notice colours and shapes and smile knowing that you can travel through your spiritual portal anytime you like. Welcome back. Oh, bliss. Oh. I feel so mellow because I'm quite a tense person and that was... Oh. <sighs> Thank you so much. That was blissful. You're welcome. I really felt like I was in a turtle's dream in outer space, you know, that Frank... <laughs> Thank wonderful. you so much, Claire. Um, how can people connect to you, find out about your shift course? What's the best point, point entry point to your universe? Oh, um, well, my website is deeplucidreaming.com and I lead uh, various courses. The shift network one is Lucid Dream Play. I also lead a 30-day Power of Dreams course uh, to guide people towards lucidity and through nightmares into healing. So yeah, the, the website is the best, the best way of contacting me, Deep Lucid Dreaming. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much for the gift of your precious time today and your precious dreaming wisdom. It's much appreciated. Thank you. And I hope everyone listening dives right into their dreams tonight after <laughs> listening to this. <laughs> I hope so too. Thank you so much, Teresa. It's always wonderful to chat to you.